I am the Shadow Lord. When I'm not traveling between different dimensions, I like to think about the smaller improv teams who only have a handful of followers on social media. Maybe less than 100 followers. Maybe less than 50. And then I think about the improv boost who wants to amplify the voice of smaller teams and companies by posting to its over 15,000 follower fan base and growing. Follow the teams that are shared and become one of the teams that are shared. Find out more on Facebook and Twitter at Boost Improv. Hashtag Get Improv Strong. <laughs> It's episode 97 of the Improv London podcast. I'm your host, Stuart Moses, and this week's guest is Chris Mead. I loved improv. <laughs> no, I don't have to sing that. That's my favourite thing when people sing the jingle. You, you put that on later, right? I do. Well, I might not bother now. I might just take your version of it and use that on every episode. Can I also, at the end, live go, that's improv! (laughs) Yes, Chris uh, has actually been on more episodes of the Improv London podcast than I have. Mm. I I think that's important to note right at the beginning of this new one. (laughs) Thanks for having me back, Stuart. Thanks for coming back. I feel part of a a pantheon of returning... Guests, yes, a, yes. Uh, you know, rarefied air, rarefied air. Yes, uh, you currently have the second most popular episode of the Improv London podcast after our glorious leader Steve Rowe. Steve Rowe, yes. Oh well, then that's so, fine. That's good, and uh, <laughs> just above uh, Katie Shoot. Wow, really? Yes. Well, Katie's far more famous than I am. I guess that's just good work with me going on the SoundCloud page every day, <laughs> clicking on my episode, slowly but surely. <laughs> like you've got time to be doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's talk about you and Katie. Let's talk about Project 2. Mm. What's happening with Project 2 at the moment? Well, there are now just two of us. Yeah, you got rid of deadweight monk house, <laughs> as I call them. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, jo- John wanted to uh, step back for a while. Um, he is one of these guys, annoying guys, who is good at everything. Um, So, you know, he's a brilliant graphic designer. He's a really good technician. He's an amazing performer. He's got too much to choose from, I think. So I think he he just got to a bit where he wanted to, um, uh, you know, do more behind-the-scenes stuff. I think he was wrestling a bit with performing, but... um, I don't know. It's really odd. I, maybe I said this last time. I should have listened to my episode in case I repeat myself. That's all right. I haven't listened back to it either, so <laughs> <laughs> that's reassuring. Jo- John and I have been friends since we were 16. Uh, I know him very well. And right from the beginning, he's always been a spectacular performer, really funny, like incredible voices and stuff. But he's never had any confidence in his own ability. Uh, even when, like, we, as I say, when we were 16 and we were doing musicals together... <laughs> Um, uh, it didn't, he, he never had that, uh, thing. So I th- just think sometimes he's like, no, I'm not sure I want to do that anymore. And he's got so much else that he yeah. can fall back on that it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting. We miss him, but it's, um, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're in demand at the moment. I believe I, I famously said we were pretty okay or something. <laughs> <laughs> When I was last on the podcast, I described Project 2 as we are all right. Um, uh, but yeah, we seem, to be, we seem to be doing pretty well. We are going all around the world teaching now, which is really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, a lot of it's to do with the fact that Katie has written a book. And then they go, Katie, would you like to come teach here? And Katie goes, yes, would you like me to perform? And they say, yes, what's the cheapest way you can perform? And she's like, well, there's 12 May Days, or you can bring Project 2, who there are only two of. Right. And they'll go, we'll have Project 2, please. <laughs> and then I get to go along too. 
which is really good. So I get to sort of, uh, um, you know, hold on to the coattails of Katie Shoot <laughs> as we as we jet around the world teaching improv and performing. Uh, and it's been amazing. We went to Amsterdam earlier in the year. What was that like? Amsterdam was incredible. I, I love the city. It's really nice to have a city that is um, based on cycling. Mm. I find that very interesting. Yes. But the festival itself is beautiful. Really great English-speaking improv community there. They put on quite the show. And it's different to other European festivals I've been to in that there's an ensemble. Uh, so you go with your own show and you do perform your own show, but you also are directed in anything up to four extra shows wow. that are picked from the ensemble of all the other groups that have come to, to perform. And we had this absolutely staggering, talented ensemble, and we got to do all these different things together. So I think I was in a um, a Dogville form where we sketched a, a village onto the ground in chalk like in the film uh, did that i was in a murder mystery um i was and then we got to do our own show as well and i think one other as well so i got to do all these different forms with all these people from all over we had people from australia we had most of north coast uh well, most of the traveling north coast uh were there from new york city um don't know why i said it like that <laughs> uh, brilliant people from amsterdam as well, and the and we had the the French group uh, Le Cop Ut. I can't do that. <laughs> um, uh, other, just such good groups, yeah. and I got to play with all of them, which was really incredible. Um, so yeah, that, that was one. Of, that was a really incredible festival. Really loved it. And then we went to Belgium, and um, and they did an ensemble as well. So uh, is this? Are you playing a format that other groups are already playing? So are you essentially playing their format, or is this a new format for the festival? It's a new form that the director has, uh, our director has brought with them. So one of them came from Rapid... Uh, no, well, from Dad's Garage in Atlanta, mm. He um, and he brought this murder mystery form, which was really cool. And particularly cool, because uh, I'm a bit geeky, as, I, as you know, Stuart, and um, Amber Nash uh, came, and she is uh, the voice of... Um, Pam movie in uh, Archer. So I was a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> by that. Um, but yeah, it was very cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it, this art form of ours? We get to go all around the world and, and, and chat with amazing people and, and do this disposable art form. <laughs> but, and it, I, I have to pinch myself quite a lot, really. Uh, so yeah, so Amsterdam, uh, Belgium... Um, and uh, uh, Sweden, uh, that was with uh, with Unmade, which I'm sure we'll get onto. And then Katie and I also going to um, Romania later wow. in the year, cool. and Poland with the May Days. So all of this free travel and m- mixing with beautiful people. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the European festival. I I believe that more people should go from our little UK community. Little large yeah, UK yeah, yeah. community I just it's so great and I'm sure we talked about this before but improvisers everywhere are improvisers you can sit down and talk to them and they'll be funny and kind and thoughtful just like improvisers here are yeah. and it doesn't take much to become friends yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you've just got that connection yeah. uh, that shared almost <laughs> shared uh, language vocabulary mm. um and there's just a seemingly infinite amount of them, Stuart, all over, <laughs> all over. It uh, makes me particularly sad that we are heading out of the European Union. I mean, like, there's a lot of other reasons. Yes. But I feel like we've got this incredible group. And, and at the moment, we can just move freely because we are European. Yes. Soon we won't be. And that is... Ah, uh, it's so horrible. It is. <laughs> it's it so is. horrible. It is. Uh, but for the, for the year that we have left... I recommend let's go to Europe, let's go to Europe. <laughs> and you know people like our stuff we are, we as a community are we've got some stuff to show off you know we're we've got some game and um uh, yeah and it's just really lovely and and there are some incredible stuff happening in other countries you know seeing some of these troops doing stuff that I 
would never have seen. Uh, just, you know, new forms. Mm. There's a uh, Finnish French group, which I really like, called Decibel, who are who do silent improv. But also, I mean, they're, they're, in, they're incredible at mime and sort of clowny stuff. But also, uh, one of them is a trained gymnast as well. Wow. So there's a lot of walking on hands and flipping <laughs> over each other and, and being lifted into the air. I feel those days where that was possible for me may have passed, <laughs> yeah. if it was ever possible. Well, yeah. well, <laughs> when I saw it in Amsterdam, uh, there were also the two beatboxers um, from North Coast. Oh, yeah. Uh, which was, um, and they they scored it all and did sound effects. Oh, yeah, yeah. Much like Jonesy in the Police Academy <laughs> franchise. Uh, and, you know, you sit in the audience, you're like, this is, this is only going to happen once. Yeah. There's no way that these two guys from New York and this lady from Finland and these two guys from France are ever going to be in the same place again. And that's... You know, every improv show is a is a miracle of 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 timing that those people are in that room for that moment. But even more so when you get international. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So let, I think we should all go. Yes. Everyone listening to yes. this, there are there's a hundred festivals in Europe and further abroad. Pick one and go to it while you still can. They are amazing. Fly the flag. <laughs> I'm using you as a public address system. Yes, please okay. do. That's very much the, uh, the role of the podcast. I wrote a blog about it too. Did where you really? I try and encourage people to go to European festivals. I, can't, I don't know what the web address is of it. Can I just say medium.com slash improv is where all my improv blogs are. Cool. Because I managed to get just slash improv on impressive. Medium. That is very impressive. No yeah, one yeah, else yeah. thought about it. <laughs> just me. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That is very cool. Yeah. So check uh, that out. Yeah, there's like five reasons to go. I've rambled on enough. <laughs> um, yeah, let's talk about uh, Project 2. Yes, um, which you are trying to get me to do ages ago, but no, I'm no, talking no, about it's, European. It's all good. No, that's, that's, no I'm, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Um, uh, and um, working as a two-prof. Mm-hmm. So if hypothetically you were going to the British Improv Project in maybe a couple of weekend's time and you were leading a couple of 90 minute sessions uh on long form two prof hypothetically it's very I don't specific does seem very specific doesn't yeah. it does seem very specific but it's not it's just a theoretical theoretical just theoretically construct a construct yeah, yeah okay uh what would you emphasize what is it about um a working as a duo that is more exciting or different from working with a large group well, obviously, I think the reason there are so many jurors out there is because it's much easier to get your group together, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. Because you only have to get two diaries <laughs> to align. Uh, so that's good. On the negative side, it costs more for room hire yeah. because you're only dividing between two. Right, yes. So let me get those practical points out the way to be with. Um, I'm sure that won't help uh, in your theoretical uh, teaching, but... I think duos are the purest form of improv. They are, if every show is essentially um, a collaboration, two brains trying to uh, network in some way to create entertainment, then uh, then a duo is the purest form of that. It's it's um, it's powered by your friendship, by your shared values, by the things that you both like. Uh, by the way that you like to play, by the things you find funny. All of that, when it's a big group, there's so many lines. So, you know, the flow chart is so large. But with a duo, it's just those two. And you can get so specific and so niche. And you can deliver a show that is kind of quite repeatable. So with the May Days, right, there's 12 of us. There's 12 of us. Um you show up to uh, there'll be something that is essentially May Days like about whatever show you go to, but you can get very very different shows depending on combination. Who, yeah, who turns yeah. up. But with a Project Two show, you are getting Katie and I's sensibility, and so I feel that there is a consistency there that other improv perhaps can't get to, or that you need to a lot, a, a huge amount of rehearsal to make that consistency. Um, I think it's a bit, 
you know Jason Schott's thing about how to do a good scene, you've got to get into a boat that's big enough for both of you. Yeah. The more people you add to that mix, the bigger the boat's got to get to encompass uh-huh. all of your sensibilities. But with a duo, it's just the two of you. You can really work and, and, and hone that show to be something beautiful. Um, so that's why I think duos are so popular. It's because you can really be- get very specific about the art you want to make. Mm. And, then you, and it's repeatable up to a point. Having said that, Project 2 is... Uh, we have this thing which John invented, which is the Solaris to Futurama scale, which is that everything on sci-fi falls somewhere between Futurama and Solaris. Futurama being immensely silly, scattershot, s- so many jokes thrown at the screen at any point, anything goes, no consistency, no real character development. It's a cartoon, everyone stays the same, really. Uh, and Solaris being silent and plodding and meticulous and beautiful with no jokes <laughs> <laughs> and science fi- everything in science fiction is somewhere between those two we try and run up and down that whole scale certainly from show to show sometimes within shows yeah. um uh and and we, we really like this idea of the game of the show rather than the game of the scene you know what happens in the first scene that sort of nails down the parameters of what the show could be you know if we edit in that way oh okay that's how we edit during that show um if we narrate stuff oh so narration's in play now that stuff is not set beforehand everything we we find out in the moment and that becomes the rules for that show Uh, and we've worked quite hard to get to a point where we can identify pretty quickly what kind of show we're going to have. And we've had like really heartfelt shows which are quite, you know, I can keep using heart, uh, affecting and, and quite deep and emotionally led. And then we've had such stupid shows. And it is really, you don't really know until you get whatever you get from the audience, plus how you're feeling on those two days. Um, so, yeah, so having said you can be incredibly specific and curated with a duo, I'm also saying we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it will always be within the massive, varied field of science fiction, which can be almost anything. So it's not really pegging it down much at all, is it? So you mentioned you and Katie's kind of sensibility. What's what's the Project 2 sensibility? Um, immense levels of geekiness. Yeah. Uh, I think we're both very technical players, we're both very heady, but we are experienced enough now that we've learnt to play against that. So I, 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 think, I think you are either a head improviser or a heart improviser. At your core, you're one or the other. Hmm. You're either incredibly technical and love language and love plot and the machinations of plot and how things fit together, or you're really doing improv because you don't want to know what happens next and all you want is to uh, connect with someone else on stage and and fall in love or get angry or become wildly jealous and break everything in your mime room. Um, <laughs> You, you, you're one or the other naturally, I would say. And then you've got to take many, many years to try and learn to be the other thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I would say our sensibility is two very technical people learning to love. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, that is, yeah. That is, that's lovely. That's what we're, we're going for. Um, and it is, I mean, you know, I, I think it's, I, I have, I am, I'm very, very lucky to be working with Katie, who has been doing it a lot longer than me and, uh, you know, is, is, is world class. Yes. So to be able to, to get on stage um, with someone who is that good, you know, you, you get better very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it really is, is a money can't buy sort of situation. So 
yeah, so that so that's I guess another part of it is I'm always incredibly grateful. <laughs> I'm always very uh, happy to be on stage. I, I I always look like I can't believe my luck. I think I think I'm known as quite a kind of positive, ebullient improviser, and a lot of that is just like, I, I mean, yeah, I mean now it's even my job, you know, partly. Was it my job when I? Oh yeah, I just started and I mm. teaching and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So now you know I I teach two or three times a week. Um, uh, the courses that I do, some of them are named after me, <laughs> which is so weird to get yes. to that point where like people like want to take a course to see see the way I improvise them and want to do a bit of that. Um, I just can't believe my luck, <laughs> essentially. So I'm uh, I'm trying not to take it for granted. Uh, and being very sort of happy about it. So I think that's also part of it too. Yeah, can you tell me about, a bit about your named courses? Well, uh, the, so there was a summer course and, and Steve was just like, can we just call it the Chris Mead summer course and see what happens? And that's evolved into the improvised theatre course. And that is about this sort of, this sort of improvising, which is, it's going to be funny, but that is not the main reason we're doing it. The main reason we're doing it is to find um, a place of connection, a place of theatricality. So it's um, it's slower. It's um, it, there's more discovery. You surprise each other more. You're unafraid to go deeply into emotion. You don't mind if there isn't laughter. Mm. It looks and feels like a scripted bit of theatre. Mm. Um, and and that's what I'm trying to teach. And I'm finding the the people who've been on it have been massively talented. And I've actually learned a huge amount from them. And each time I do the course, I feel like I incorporate all the best stuff from the things I've seen. A lot of this course is me just watching great improvisers do great work. I'm yeah. going, hmm, that's really good. I should <laughs> note that down uh, and talk about it before. But it's just finding that different pace, not having to feel like you have to make gags all the time. Mm. Um knowing exactly how you feel about everyone on stage. There's there's no um, being shot and going, oh, that's inconvenient. You know, <laughs> this is howling and dropping to the floor. Uh, I mean, not a lot of people get shot, actually, think about it. But um, that whole thing about pinch and ouch, if one, if one scene partner pinches you, you, you don't shrug it off. You mm. feel it. Mm. You're changed by it. Um, I love all that stuff. Um, I, was always, I was super inspired by... TJ and Dave and um, Paralena Gramophonograph, um, the um, Dasariski, these really sort of theatrical groups mm. that really, uh, the, the laughter is a byproduct of connection mm. and delight in the work, not uh, something that they're striving for as, as a first and foremost goal. Um, yeah, and, and it's been going for a while now. I think we've done four or five of them and there's even a kind of advanced version now for wow. people who've done one course and wanted to keep doing stuff in this style yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i'm starting to see it it sort of leak out into shows you know people are kind of using this style a bit more yeah. um and I'm, I'm glad to be an ambassador for it although obviously um it, it, it's not like i made it up or anything no. i just got very excited about it and wanted to teach more of it um, yes, I'm really massively uh, excited about it, and it, it's um, it's been a really it's been my favourite stuff to teach. Yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, and and it's been and you're on it, aren't you? Now? Yes, you're... yes, we had the first night. Last <laughs> the night. first last very, night, very enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a, it's a really yeah. As I say, I I always look like the cat that got the cream <laughs> because what a great way to spend your evenings. Yes. Watching great people do brilliant stuff. Yes. Mm. Yes. No, I very much enjoy um, the emotional connection, um, that kind of deliberately slower pace. We're not going slow because we can't think of what to say, but we're leaving space. And space and silence are so powerful yeah. when used properly. So, uh, yeah, they are. And it, uh, that's sort of, I guess, where unmade theatre came from. Because um, I wanted to do... I was teaching it. I wanted to kind of do that work. I mean, unmade theatre used to be called Sonder, which I think, uh, and Sonder came out of emotion play, which we were definitely talking about mm, last time. Yeah. So emotion play was my first show I directed with these vague ideas of 
let's move past doing a kind of wacky sketch show with a form that everyone knows and let's try and make theatre because my background's in theatre my degree is in theatre I was did scripted shows for years until I found improv for like almost three decades of, of being an actor um, and I and when I found improv, I knew that was the thing that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And now kind of moving those two, two things together. So we did a motion play, uh, which was, for me, the most, um, oh, what's the word I want? Um, fulfilling. Mm-hmm. It was the most fulfilling work I, I had done that I had created myself. Um, so I really loved that. And then, uh, and then after a motion play... After, I, could say, I can't keep doing originals. I've set up the originals so other people can do so. <laughs> I can't keep filling up those spaces. So I decided to make a theatre company. Uh, and I started that with Sally Hodgkiss and Emily Murphy. Um, because I thought they were brilliant. And they uh, weren't in many groups at that point. Now Sally's in every group. Because <laughs> uh, everyone recognises how brilliant she is. Um um, but the three of us became the co-artistic directors of, of what was called Sonder. It's now called Unmade. So with Sonder, Sonder is... The definition of Sonder is... is uh, You walk down the street and you pass someone and you just have that realisation that their inner life is as complicated and uh, expansive as yours is. And then you notice everyone and you realise everyone has got a whole world inside them that you'll never know. That's so Sonder. Did you experience Sonder, Sonder, as you realised that there were all these other groups that were also called, called Sonder, Sonder. Yeah, and yeah. they all had their own rich inner lives? <laughs> That's absolutely true, yeah. And uh, what we'd missed was that there weren't other improv theatre companies yeah. called Sonder, but there were certainly a lot of other theatre companies ah, called Sonder. Right. Uh, no one is called Unmade. Uh, Unmade comes from uh, a quote in a book called The Girl Who Drank the Moon. And it's essentially the idea that artists to create need to first unmake themselves and use the pieces of who they are to create new art. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true of improv more than anything. We unmake our experience, we unmake ourselves, we unpack our experiences, our emotions, our thoughts, our um, theories about things, and we use these component bits, like a, a amino acids creating proteins i think that's right yes that's definitely uh, right. to create art so yeah you must first unmake before you can make so that's why we're unmade theater co uh, <laughs> um so yeah so we made never folk last year with a very brilliant cast that went super well we launched the new nursery uh, when the new space opened we were the first thing in um, we really benefited from that had great audiences but also really good word of mouth too and that was all about folk tales and mm. whether the stories we tell, uh, you know, make us. Do we make the stories? Or do the stories make us? So you, with that, you started the first section of it was a, a kind of a, a myth? improvised folk tale. Yeah, yeah. 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 That we we did in using movement and shared the narration of mm. and created in the moment there. Uh, and then the ideas and concepts that came out of that were then the inspiration for modern contemporary scenes in Mm. the second half. Mm. Uh, So that was glorious. I really loved that. Uh, And then then we've just done The Long Weekend, which is actually a form we didn't create. It was uh, uh, created by Christine Brooks, who is a New Zealand-based improviser. She is in Wellington. And when I was... (laughs) Me and Laura, my wife, were travelling. We went to Japan... Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. And while we're in New Zealand, oh, obviously, I was like, we're not going to do any improv. But as soon as I went anywhere, I then sought out all the improvisers. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that because mm. I remember before you were going, and it was going to be a break from improv. You were, no, Stuart, it was not. I did not think it was, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> so I found myself sit, sit, sitting down with these uh, brilliant improvisers in Wellington. Uh, who were just about to start an improv festival there, actually, and I'd timed it just wrong where I was leaving the day they were starting. Oh, no. <laughs> but they they came and, and I don't know how they had the time, but they came and, and spent an afternoon with me. I was talking to Christine, and she was talking about this idea she'd done at a couple of festivals, which was um, sort of very loosely based on Peter's Friends, the film Peter's yeah, Friends. Yeah, yeah. So it was about a group of university buddies who got back together after... Um, 10 years-ish, a, mm. a while apart, 
and found what they were to each other now. Mm. So, uh, and I just couldn't get that idea out of my head. So I, when I got back, I Skyped her and asked if I could use that. And we, we had a bunch of talks about how, how she had done it. And there were a few things like full set. So, you know, there were sofas and, and chairs and uh, real tables, uh, real board games, real paperback books, real um, non-alcoholic alcohol. So everything was real. You couldn't mime anything. Right. So that had all the trappings of a play. Um, so we did all that. Uh, it was so cool. Yeah. So, you know, if you're on your phone, you're actually on your phone and stuff wow. like that. It was really interesting. Uh, and yeah, and then you get to play this brilliant game of normally in a scene you come in and you go, well, who are we to each other, right? What What is our relationship? And that's hard enough. But in this form, you're like, who are we to each other now? But also, who were we to each other? And what is the space between those two relationships? Yeah. And are we happy about it? Or yeah, are we yeah. heartbroken about it? Um, so you've got these, you create these two whole worlds, the people you were, the people you are. And then lay them on top of each other. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then do an hour long straight play about it. And us being uh, unmade, we also put in physical theatre. So we had two sections of movement that also spoke to the emotional uh, relationship between people and um, sort of provided a second act in the middle of the show mm. that echoed into the future of what might happen so we did moves that we then did later on uh, so we said previews of moves we were going to do later on so we sort of extrapolated forward what might happen to our character wow. did them in dance form and then did them in real form later on oh that's amazing it was pretty hard <laughs> when it worked it was beautiful but also kind of gave clues of how people were feeling underneath the words they were actually saying yeah um you know who liked who 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 despised who and all that stuff uh, and yeah, we, 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 we premiered that at the Swedish Improv Festival, which is another incredible improv there to, uh, festival. I won't go back into that now. And then, yeah, and then ran it at the nursery. And it was again, it was brilliant. Um, I can't believe the people who agreed to be in it. <laughs> so it was me and Sally again. And then we had Mark Johnson, who's been in every Unmade show. Yes, he's been good. amazing. Uh, Amy Cook Hodgson. Uh, who's a stunning improviser, and Ed Farger, who I... Was, yeah. So one of the reasons I... St one of the other reasons I started I made was this idea that you are in an improv troupe and then you are with them until you either kill each other <laughs> or become so successful that you don't need to be in that group anymore <laughs> or just keep going forever. Uh, that's sort of how our community is structured. That's how we make our art. Hmm. And and I was looking back at what I used to do, sort of my Amdram days and university stuff. And what that happens there is the theatre company puts a cast together and that cast knows it's going to be together for 8, 12, 16 weeks. You know you've got a set amount of performances that are going to be a run one after another. And at the end of it, you'll go your separate ways not because you're angry with each other, <laughs> but just because that was what always was going to happen. Yeah. So I was, you know, I, I feel like I improvise quite all over the place. I was seeing all these brilliant people at the FA, at Monkey Toast, in my classes at the nursery and Hoopla. Um, and I wanted to work with these brilliant people. And I know that we couldn't do an ongoing concern, mm. but this idea of being able to put together casts for specific productions mean that I can work with these people. Mm. So Ed was someone I wanted to work with uh, because I just saw him around and saw how good he was. Mm. And, yeah, and, you know, obviously with Amy and her work in Ostentatious and uh, with the Blight and stuff. Um, and it was just... And now I can, you know, mm. like just eight weeks of your time. And and what you find is even these brilliant people, they want to do something different every now and then. Yeah. Um, because it because it's just interesting to have a change. And they know that there's an end to it. So it doesn't feel like cheating on their main group. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you get these people. You, I, I, yeah, you've got to ask. That's the thing. Yes. I, I, 
I, I don't want to count myself out without having even asked. Mm. Yeah, because it's delightful to be asked, and if you can't make it, you can't do it. And that's, you know, no one's yeah. offended because you were asked. Yeah, you know, and there'll asked. be people who haven't been able to do it this time that will be in the next show. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, you know, I have three groups. Two of them I'm in all the time, and we'll know we'll keep going with them. Mm. Uh, and then this group this theatre company will allow me to work with all sorts of people on longer term things and smaller things. Hmm. Uh, and it's me, but it's always me, Sally and Emily at, at the heart of that. Hmm. Emily's, Emily's had a baby, so yes. can't be in a show at the moment yes. because she has an audience member, uh, an audience of one who is very demanding <laughs> yes. currently. Uh, but yeah. Constantly yeah, calling out from suggestions. For milk. Yeah, as audiences tend yeah. to do. Give us milk! <laughs> no audience. <laughs> Have a well-crafted story instead. <laughs> um, yeah, so so that's really good. I, I, I say I find myself in a, in a great place where I get to do all of that stuff. So you mentioned you're in three groups. We've talked about Project 2, we've talked about Unmade Theatre. Let's talk about the May Days. So the May Days are... So influential and um, amazing. And they've been through... And they're so old as a group, right? They've been around for longer than almost anyone. Um, And I'm super new to the group. I've been part of it for about a a year and a half. They don't take new May Days very often. So it's it's really nice. But it's it's such um, an operation. We do corporates. We have a... um, uh, hierarchy of structure there are three directors who make all the business decisions and they are um, rotated in and out voted in and out there's two artistic directors which are chosen in the same way there's a corporate ring, wing and we have a, an employee who who a freelancer who who gets us corporate jobs they are uh, you know, they, they run a whole school in Brighton as well as drop-ins via the nursery it's this massive operation uh, and and it's and it's part owned. Each person in the May Days. That's why it's so hard to get into the May Days. Is because once you are, you are a shareholder in the company mm, mm. that is the May Days. Yeah, I didn't realize so, that. Uh, from a business point of view, so we are all sh- um, we are we each own a twelfth of the company. Ah. Um, and as I say, you know, the turnover is, is massive, and it's a proper business. Mm. So it seems it's on a different scale to everything else I mm. do. And I'm a much smaller part of it. Whereas I think, you know, founding member of Unmade and Project 2, I'm the absolute opposite in the May days. But they're such fun people and and they put so many mechanisms in place to make sure that it doesn't get dull. You know, the May days do a lot of shows and we're even with Happily Never Not After, which is our festival show and our nursery show, we only do it at the nursery and when we're abroad. Um, that's been very successful. Mm. Um, but we're still starting to make a new show now, you know. Really? Every, and, and what I also love is these people are so experienced and they, we still meet up regularly, you know, yeah. tw- uh, tw- twice a month, every other Monday come rain or shine yeah. to try and get better and to to have new ideas and dream new dreams and stuff. <laughs> I just think, are there many groups who have been together for 12 years who are still saying, well, we're not done, you yeah, know, yeah. still so much to do. And I think that is testimony to that group. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very honoured to be in it. I feel like a much smaller part of it, because I am, I'm one twelfth of it, yeah, rather yeah. than... One well, hmm. Project Two isn't half actually because we have the brilliant uh, Fred Deakin, who's our uh, our musician, yes, uh, and designer, uh, and he is. I would say we're thirds really with him now. Yeah. He's he brings so much to it. Um, it is the three of us really. Um, but yeah, much smaller percentage in the May days. But I am in awe of what they've created or what we've created. I guess <laughs> now what they've created and what we continue to create uh, with that. What do you bring to the May Days? What's your role in the group? Oh, man. I mean, 
optimism, I guess. But I'm not the only one. There's some very bouncy people in the May Days, but no. I'm certainly one of those. <laughs> no, I, in my, my mind, it's like the uh, Futurama Solaris scale, and now I'm just placing the members of the May, of May Days on that, on that scale. scale. Yeah. Or at least the um, persona they project on that yeah, scale. You sort of John Kramer. <laughs> yeah, you've got John and Jules down one end <laughs> and me and Heather down the other end. <laughs> Everyone else falls somewhere in the middle of those. Um, yeah, no, it's um, it's really interesting when you have 12 personalities. Mm. We also have a therapist. Really? Did I about that? Yeah. Deanna Troy. Uh, yeah, a kind of Deanna <laughs> Troy. Um, so uh, regularly we all sit down and talk about what pisses us off about each other and then it's fine. I don't think you could stay together for over a decade if you haven't got some kind of uh, mechanism. I didn't know that to regulate. But if someone said, "Oh, by the way, there's an improv group that has their own therapist," and I'd probably go, "Yeah, yeah probably it's the, the main days. Days. Yeah. <laughs> So, what sort of uh, approach does this therapist take? Is they, you know, are they Freudian? Are they cognitive behavioural <laughs> therapy? Is it a? Uh, there's been different ones over the years. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's more like we sit down and it's a safe space and we can say what we need to say and we know no one's going to get offended. Uh, and we didn't feel like we could, um, share that ourselves. There needs to be someone who's on the outside who calls us out on, it calls us out on things. So everyone's in the room. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Cause I imagined you all went to see the therapist individually. Oh no, no, it's group sessions. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. God. <laughs> that is amazing. That's just amazing. Yeah, amazing and terrifying. Isn't yeah, it? terrifying was the other word I was thinking yeah, yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I got that. I got that. <laughs> but yeah, it's. Uh, I just don't think you can last that long and still all like each other. We all do genuinely like each other and are have functional relationships. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and we're very, very different people. Yes. And it takes some work. Yeah, it's like marriage, Stuart. Right, Let me, me say marriage. this. Yes. Let me say this about marriage. There's two. I feel like there's two schools of thought. One is that you get you find the right person, and love just is there, and it and 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 that takes care of you because you're in love, and that's all you need. That's the unrealistic approach. Yeah, and then there's this idea that every morning you wake up and you make the decision to keep loving that person, and in some ways that seems pragmatic, but in other ways it's the most amazing thing in the world that. People do that every day. You wake up and you say, yes, you are the person. I make that decision anew every morning. Um, and <laughs> where was I going with this? Yes, with a with an improv group, it's the same thing. You, you don't have a magical connection and then, you know, that's gifted to you and then you never have to work of being in a group again. You have to, you, you change, each individual member of that troop changes, the group dynamic changes, how you are viewed by the community uh, changes as well, you know, your place within it. At the moment, you know, the May Days are, are, are riding quite high, we're being invited to a lot of places and and it's, you know, we're never short of, of offers to go and teach and perform, mm. that hasn't always been the case won't be the case again. We'll be just flavour of the month at the moment. Um, and so all of that stuff is shifting all the time. And you have to, in in the light of every new morning, establish where you are and say, yep, this is where I am. This is where everyone else is. And I choose, you know, to to keep going, to mm. create these things together and, and be in a group together. You can't ever get to a point where it's just... You do it because you always have. Mm-hmm. So you feel like you always should. Are we That's... talking about marriage or improv groups? I, I mean, my wife will probably agree with this, that I see, don't see the difference. <laughs> <laughs> There's very little difference. No, they're, they're, they're both incredibly important parts of my life. And I see many parallels between the two. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's commitment, isn't it? Yeah. That's the thing that everyone, you have to have commitment. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that's why we have someone who calls us on our shit, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Uh, you said this, you're being passive aggressive or whatever, you know, just say what you mean yeah. and it all comes out and I mean, it doesn't, you know, I'm making it seem like it's very easy. It's been horrible. Yeah. Of course it has, but we get through it and we're stronger for it. 
Improv. Improv. <laughs> wow. Uh, really, so I'm just really intrigued. Uh, I will say, um, Maydays are one of my favourite groups, and sometimes if I'm not really enjoying a class or a workshop or a jam, I will try to be a member of the Maydays. Sure. Just, just you know, as a way of kind of like having my own extra game to get me through. <laughs> yeah. But you, uh, you'll try and be what, like... I will choose a Mayday and I will try, try and, and perform a... uh, as they would perform for the That's rest of amazing. that session. I would like you... I'd like to see you be Creamer. Yeah. Yes. I'm not asking you to do it now. No. I just, I'm going to see on stage if I ever... Or if you're in one of my workshops. I'm yes. like, Stuart has started acting really weirdly. This means he's bored and is trying to be a Mayday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. That, oh, I've given away my secret there. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, uh, my impressions, not my impressions, my uh, inspiration is always, uh, you know, I'm not very good at it is what I'm saying here, so it's not obvious that I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's just an essence thing. Right? I find that's a really amazing uh, thing to do when, when, as you say, when you're stuck in a scene or a show, mm. just find someone you admire and just be them. Mm. You never have to say anything about it. You don't have to do accents or an yeah. impression. It's just like, what do they bring to the stage? What's their spirit? Yeah. What's their kind of soul sort of thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think you're right that the May Days are very specific. We're almost like we're written. Like we're archetypes. <laughs> yes. Like some weird... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. I'm really into the Enneagram at the moment. Do you know that? It's the personality... Tell me what. Well, I sound really into it. I can't even remember how many. I think there's nine. Yeah. Uh, and I am very definitely a seven. Oh. The seven is called the enthusiast. Really? Or perhaps the generalist. Right. Because you're so excited by everything that you, you know, you, 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 become, you become so enchanted by everything. You try everything. You're like suddenly you're into cycling for a while and then pottery hmm. and then you want to do power kiting. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's been true of me for my whole life, except for improv, which is the one thing that has stuck, yes. absolutely stuck. And, you know, I know it's never going to go anywhere. But apart from that, I'm like, oh, now I'm going to start cooking uh, or I'm going to... <laughs> the thing we're doing at the moment a bit is, have you heard this thing about uh, people painting on pebbles and then putting the pebbles out in the street so other people find a, a lovely surprise. Yes. Yeah, well, my sister has got really into it. So I've uh, been uh, painting pebbles with my nieces and nephews and then putting them out. And I just find it really exciting because there's like Facebook groups you write on the back where, and then when people find it, they go online and, and say, look, you've, I have this thing. <laughs> I've been writing quotes from Doctor Who. And putting oh, really? Them in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been it's been good, so yeah. So basically, I get excited by stuff and then do it for ages, and that is uh, number seven. But why was I think why, where I started all of this was uh, perhaps um, each mayday exemplifies a different Archetype. kind. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm thinking of a tarot. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we haven't thought this through. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you seem you are a very enthusiastic person. Yeah. What's the dark side? What's the dark side to that? What's your dark side? What's my dark side? Um, I feel it's 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 weird. You start off when I started off improv. Obviously, I um, I just loved it, and I went on to everything. I tried every class. I did everything multiple times. I spent every day doing it. Really, and it's weird as you do it more, and. Your standing in the community increases. It's further to fall. So I, every now and then I find I go on stage and I notice there's people that I've taught in the audience or um, or people I really admire in the audience. And I'm not as able as I used to be to be like, I don't care. Yeah. And that makes me sad. I want to get back to a point where I genuinely... I'm concentrating on the show and I don't, I'm not worried about who's in the audience. I don't feel like I have to be good so that people come back to my class and think, yes, you are worthy of teaching me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 it, that's hard. That's, I find that really hard. Um, so yeah, I think that's the thing at the moment. 
that I'm like, oh, I have some measure of standing now. How do I not lose this? Yeah. And like, well, I gained it by not caring about it. So how do I get back to that point again? Um, so yeah, I think that's me being disarmingly honest about that. <laughs> I hope. Um, yeah, it's like, how can you, how can you celebrate success without becoming kind of trying to guard it and hoard it and yeah. like, well, perhaps I won't do this show because oh, because what, what strategically, if, yes, yeah. yeah, all that sort of stuff. I just want to be like, it's improv. Of course, I'm doing it. That's amazing. <laughs> or I'm allowed to do it. I'm allowed to do this. Um, yes. So I, I want to guard against that. I don't think it's a big problem, but I have definitely noticed that tendency in myself. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It is weird. Oh man. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's true. You know, of every endeavor, you you. Um, you get to a point where you're... If you ever get to a point where you think you're a master, then you have lost it. <laughs> I was reading this brilliant article uh, about Ricky Gervais. Have you seen this? There's, I think it's called something like what, uh, what, what Went Wrong with Ricky Gervais. And it's about this guy. Like He invented you know, this incredible new way of doing TV yeah. and The Office was this incredible sitcom. Yeah. But he... He is such an e exemplar of, of this thing that he is now so worried about his place as a comedy legend. Mm. He He's trying to interview people that are his heroes so he can sort of be in the same place as them. Uh, and, and he's become very abusive and defensive on Twitter of anyone who says anything against him. Mm. And at the same time, his work, has never really reached the heights of the office again. In mm. fact, it's a real law of diminishing returns. You know, none of his films have really worked. Um, and and Extras was good, but not as good as The Office. And Life is Short wasn't good at all. And mm. each one, and Derek, less said about Derek, really. Mm. Except for Ruth Bratt, who is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that sort of... And he's losing, and he's always looking around, and 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 he's basically his. He just had a Netflix special out, um, and this is what the article is saying. And essentially, much of that is him just attacking Twitter followers, probably Twitter followers who have like fifty people themselves. Yeah. He's just punching down on all these people yeah, yeah, yeah. who don't agree with him, and I think, I think that's because he believes he deserves respect rather than doing work that. Uh, creates respect yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so i think that is the worst thing that he ricky gervais is a warning to us all right that we have to we uh, remain a um an enthusiast and do it because you know at heart be a hobbyist yes. at heart do it because you love it hmm. um and the rest will follow cool yeah Right, time for the big, the big final question. Whoa. The big final question. Gosh, which uh, won't be a surprise because you've listened to the podcast before. What's the Chris Me <laughs> signature, signature move? move. Um, I normally say a bit about just to give the person time to think. Yes. What's the move that brings a house down? What's the thing that you save the day and they go classic Mead? That's why I say it to give people time to think. I know I say it the same thing every time. I think what I I'm pretty good at is I'm pretty good at finding something um, at the end of the show that is a callback or something that brings everything together. Finding a moment that, uh, yeah, I, I have, I, my brain is the kind of brain that, that finds links and plots and, and, and bring things full circle. Nice. Um, I can remember once, at, it was in a uh, Mayday show at Osho, and right at the beginning of the show, I was just playing this old guy with a Zimmer frame who was walking across the stage. He didn't really do a lot, but he had a little interaction with someone. Um, and that was the end of that character. And then at the end, another one of my characters I was playing got... Um, everyone else got sent forwards in time, except for my character. And then, I don't know, just as this big vortex appeared that was made of maydays swirling around and everyone else jumped through i realized that then i was going to have to go the long way around in order to get oh. to the plane place and then that character became the old man character so as everyone spun out i found myself in exactly the same position on stage 
grabbed my mime Zimmer frame and made the same moves. And yeah, and that sort of bring, brought everything back together. Not something you could plan. Yeah. It was something that my brain was just relaxed enough that it could grab hold of that thing and bring it back. And I, I don't think I've ever had more people come up to me like, that must have been planned. You know, like, <laughs> no, no, it just, it just, I, I was supported by brilliant people and you just reached out and it was just right there. Yeah. I think my brain can do that even in a crisis, even when it's thinking about 15 other things, it can find the thing that brings it all together. On my best day. That's what we're talking about though, right? Yeah, On my yeah, best yeah, day. Yeah. On my worst day, I flail around and uh, then just do a forward roll because that seems to work. So that would be my <laughs> secondary move, would be doing a forward roll. All right. Excellent. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, I love... Have you not ever seen me do a forward roll? I, I have. When I'm out of ideas, <laughs> I'll do a forward roll. So I... I um, you embody, must have seen shows. I embody the spirit of a mayday. You do a forward roll. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Good. It works. People are like, wow, he's old and he can still do a forward roll. <laughs> still got it. <laughs> still got it. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you for being a guest on the Improv London podcast. Thank you. It's lovely to be on an improv podcast. <laughs> Hooray! Can I can I say it? Please do. That's improv. I made this. That's improv. <laughs> <laughs>